Welcome to our time of worship this morning. What a privilege it is to come and gather and worship our King. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. We have lit the candle of joy. Please join me in our Advent litany. I will read the leader part and you are invited to respond with the congregational part marked with a C. In a world divided and hurting. Jesus, you are near to us. In a world preoccupied with the holiday rush. God promises us in his word that he is our source of joy. You have made known the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with your eternal pleasure at your right hand. Jesus, we trust in you and the promises of your word. Please join in singing with us, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. us this morning with these words from John 1. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Please take a few moments to greet those who are worshiping around you today.
please join me in a prayer of confession. Lord Christ, we cast our minds to Calvary, where you poured out your love for us and confess. We confess our willingness to be loved, but also our reluctance to love. We confess our readiness to accept your forgiving love, but also our refusal to forgive. We confess our eagerness to grasp your offer of redeeming love, but also our resistance to follow you without question. In this Advent time, forgive us of our failure to respond as we should. Come to us anew, and by your grace, assist us to receive you with joy as the shepherds, with gratitude as Simeon, with obedience as Mary, with love as you have loved us. Amen. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Just a couple of announcements to share with you before we join the Lord in prayer. The first one is Daryl Alferts was admitted to the hospital. Uh, he has pain all over the place. We don't know what's going on, so he's undergoing tests and observations. So please pray for Daryl and Shirley. Also, Bertha Voss suffered a stroke on Thursday night, and uh, she's in the hospital for tests and observations it's been a rough uh, fall for Dwayne and Bertha, and so we want to uh, certainly remember them in our prayers. We have a great God who likes to hear us. Let's join him in prayer. Father in heaven, we do come before you in Jesus' name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we thank you and praise you that each day we find life and hope in him. And Father, on this third Sunday of Advent, we thank you for the gift of your Son and our Savior. 
And so we are grateful for his first coming. We thank you, Lord, that he came and he took on human nature, that he clothed himself in human brokenness and sin. As Paul says, that you made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. And we pray that that gospel will reach into this world and that every child, woman, and man from every tribe and nation and language will come to know the beauty of Jesus Christ. We're thankful that the advent of your Son is our confidence in the present. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he is with us by your Holy Spirit today. And with the Apostle Paul, we're grateful that we can say that nothing will separate us from your love revealed in Jesus. And so today we're safe. And so we thank you that you have shown that presence and that kindness to Joyce Christians and Jerry Gorder and Jerry and Marsha Van Ginkle. And we thank you that you will continue to show it to Larry Faber and Bertha Voss and Daryl Alferts. And Father, those are names of people that represent our whole congregation. They represent joy, and they represent struggle, and they represent hope. But all of them represent confidence, too. The confidence that whatever we face, nothing can separate us from your love. And Father, we look to the future with great hope, because you have said there's a day when we will lift up our eyes and our ears will hear the words that now the dwelling of God is with children, women, and men. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And Father, we look forward to that day when the dead will be raised. We look forward to that day of no more, no more death and no more pain and no more hostility. And we look forward to the day when we will see Jesus face to face, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, Father, in the midst of all that, we come with joy, hearts of joy. Our mouths are filled with laughter, as the psalmist says, and our tongues with songs of joy because of who you are and all that you have accomplished through your Son and in our lives. And, Father, we pray that that gospel will go out into the world and every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Be with us now as we give our gifts. We thank you for the ministry of ministry shares and the global gospel. We thank you for the privilege to listen to your word. And we ask, Lord, that in all that we do, we will bring you honor and glory. In the great and beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our offering is for ministry shares. It's the way we as a denomination in the United States and Canada uh, partner in God's great global mission. And uh, so it's a privilege for us to give. The different ways you can give are listed on the screen. And so if you can prayerfully consider it, that would be great. While you're thinking about that, we're going to watch a brief video. Uh, there is a new small group, perhaps more than one, that will start in the new year. And uh, you can watch this video. It's entitled Crazy Busy by Kevin DeYoung, a small group. And then I'll have some information when the video is done. People talk about busyness a lot as kind of a nuisance, but they're, they're actually very serious dangers. And maybe the world will quickly talk about some of the physical manifestations and stress and anxiety or going to gain weight or it's not a very healthy lifestyle. But even more significant, I think, are the emotional and spiritual dangers that come with busyness. Uh, there's a danger that we're robbed of our joy, that we, we go through life as a perpetual sort of crank. Uh, I know w when I get busy is when I'm the least Christ-like to my wife and to my kids. There's just this constant noise and pressure. And God made us and wired us for, for a rhythm, for rest and routine and work and then retreat. And when we violate that rhythm, it robs us of joy and it, it robs other people of joy. So, so that's a risk. I also think there's there's certainly a risk to our heart. Uh, you know what it, what it says about our heart, the the pride that's there, how it fuels uh, the love of man or the the fear of man, and there's a real rot that can set in in our soul. 
And you think of Jesus' parable about the sowers and the soils and the, you know, the progression that, you know, it gets thrown on the ground and it gets eaten up right away and then it springs up. And, and, and the one that, that, that starts to make it, starts to show life, but then gets choked out by thorns. And Jesus says, one of those thorns is it's just the worries of life. I mean, probably busyness has killed more Christians than, than bullets. A busyness that chokes out the Word of God. It's, it's every time that we come home and it's the, the preparations for a meal or it's Sunday afternoon football or it's homework for Monday that robs the seed of the Word of God that had been planted. It's all of that pressure and busyness that really threatens our spiritual life and even masks the fact that we have a soul. I mean, not only does it does it do damage, but some of us live at such a hectic pace with so little self-reflection or space that we forget that we're even spiritual creatures. So the small group is entitled Crazy Busy. If you're interested, it's for five weeks. It's going to be on Sunday nights from 6 to 7.30 here in the church facility. Information is found in your ministry newsletter. If you're a guest with us, you can find one of those across uh, from our mailboxes over there. Um, if you are interested, contact Cole Plug and Cool. Um, we'll make as many groups as we want, but uh, would love to see you uh, involve yourself in that. As we prepare to hear God's word from Psalm 126, we're going to be blessed by a duet by Lindsay Messman and Chloe Bosma, and we're so happy that you're here to lead us in worship.
Thank you so much. That was beautiful. What a great introduction to Psalm 126, the psalm of Advent joy, and Advent joy because of that small child, Jesus Christ, who came into the world. So far, as we've been looking at Advent, the coming of Jesus Christ, we've looked at this through the Psalms of Ascent. And so we've looked at Psalm 120, and we said Advent means we're fed up with life the way it is. Then we looked at Psalm 121 and said Advent uh, journeys with us through the hills and all of its dangers. And today, Advent means there is incredible joy. And so these words. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. May God bless his good and gracious word. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the gospel of your Advent Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is the gift of Advent joy. And we pray, Lord, that we will once again discover and appreciate the joy that you give in him. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. The great composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, said this, God's gift to his soaring creatures is to give them the joy that is worthy of their destiny. It was simply his way of recognizing that God created us to be creatures of joy. That in sending Jesus Christ, he redeemed us for joy. And that as we point ourselves into the future, he is coming again and there will be eternal joy. But Advent simply means that in Jesus Christ we have received God's gift and it's given to his sorrowing creatures to give them the joy worthy of their destiny. Right at the center of these words of Psalm 126, the second part of verse 3, are the words, we are filled with joy. The inevitable question is, what does that mean? What do we learn? And what we learn is that joy is not feeling good about ourselves. What we do learn is that joy is feeling good about God. It's feeling good about his first advent. It's feeling good about his second advent. It's feeling good about who he is. It's feeling good about what he has accomplished. That joy gets expressed as a profession of faith. And the joy we profess goes something like this, that I am not my own, but I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Joy is belonging. And the fruit of belonging to the love of God in Jesus Christ is simply that. It's joy. Perhaps an Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk, expressed the praise that is the fruit of that joy. He said, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. He just said, whatever happens in life, in richness or in poverty, when everything has been stripped away, joy is measured not by our circumstance, but by belonging to God. And so the psalmist says, our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. 
But what does it look like? What does that joy look like? What does it look like in a materialistic culture where joy is found in stuff only to discover that there's never enough stuff or the stuff we have fades away and we need something new and joy is this thing that just sort of seems to evaporate. What does joy look like, as Carl Truman says, in our current culture with the triumph of the psychological person? where everything is measured by the standard of whether I feel good. And even when I feel good, why does it keep evaporating and it's never enough? What is joy in that context? Or what is joy in the midst of all the moralism that still dominates the landscape? That somehow if I keep all the rules and do all the right things, then God will just love me a little more and then I'll just have a little more happiness and joy, right? I'll earn it. And yet in this psalm, joy doesn't settle for those cheap and ultimately debilitating substitutes. Joy actually looks like this. Joy are persecuted believers, sisters and brothers who lose all they have, whose reputations are tarnished and some whose heads are lopped off simply because they proclaim the name of Christ and yet find incredible joy to bear witness to his name in the most dangerous parts of the world. Joy is an apostle, his name Paul, chained to two Roman imperial guards and in his isolation he pens the book of Philippians, and he says, I rejoice in my thinking of you. And I rejoice in you because I know that you are the product of God's grace. And he who began a good work will bring it to completion. And it brings me great joy. Joy are a lot of the seniors in our midst. Some who have seen the worst of days and seen the best of days. They've been in wars, and they've also lived in plenty. And what they recognize is that what gives them life and hope are neither of those things, but the fact that they can say, I belong to my faithful Savior. Joy is Paul who, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, gives a litany of all the pain and brokenness and attacks against his life. And yet he says, if I were to do it all over again, I would. I have such great joy in representing Jesus and the gospel. And it's not that these people are naive. These are people who understand Psalm 120 and they're fed up with life. They're fed up with all of the assaults upon the well-being of our dignity and our value. These are people who understand Psalm 121 and they see the hills with all of its threat and danger and vulnerability and challenge to our existence. But in spite of that, they say, but that still doesn't take away our joy because joy is this. I belong. I belong to my faithful Savior in life and in death. And when everything else abandons me and when everyone else is against me, I still belong. And so says the psalmist, our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. You take a look at Psalm 126 and I already mentioned that in verse 3, the second part, right in the very center of the psalm, it says we are filled with joy. But there's a really interesting thing about this. Everything before that, verses 1 through 3a, is past tense. And everything after that is future tense. And it's the psalmist's way of saying, I'm looking to the first advent, and I'm filled with joy. And I'm looking to the second advent, and I'm filled with joy. 
And the privilege we have today is to say, I look to the first advent, the first coming of Jesus, and today we can be filled with joy. And I'm looking to the second advent, anticipating His return, and I'm filled with joy. Look at the way Israel frames the story for themselves. They look to the past. The psalmist says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we are like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. What are those great things? The psalmist could be looking to the past, and he sees God show up when Israel is in Egypt when they were slaves and they had harsh masters and living conditions were terrible and they were a hated people. And then one day, suddenly, God demonstrates His amazing presence. He arrives on the scene, pours out His grace, and one day Israel is making bricks and the next day they're writing a song and they cross a Red Sea and they sing. I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and His rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He's my joy. Maybe the psalmist is looking at David, anointed to be king, and yet had this checkered, colorful, despicable history. Endless war with the Philistines. Threats on his own life from that crazy man Saul. Guilt for the murder of Uriah so that he could have adultery with Bathsheba. A son who forced him out of town and he had to set up his government in exile. And suddenly one day God shows up on the scene and floods this man's life with grace and he is restored. And he writes a song and he says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. I can dance with joy. Or maybe he's looking back at the time when Israel was exiled in Babylon. The terrible days for the people of God. Days filled with rape. Days filled with cannibalism. Days filled with bestiality. Days when they were forced to walk 600 miles in a sun-baked desert, mocking their God, mocking their people. And suddenly, suddenly God shows up on the scene and they get to return and they get to rebuild a temple and a prophet by the name of Isaiah says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Her warfare is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And then it says, and together they sang the songs of joy. He looks to the past. Whatever happens, we are a people filled with joy because God has come and I belong to Him. And then he turns his eyes to the future. He says, we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord. Like streams in the Negev, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying the sheaves with them. The future. The Negev was a desert south of Israel. And for most of the year, the ditches would be dry, the land parched, the desert sun baking everything. And then the rains would come. And suddenly the ditches would be filled with water. Blossoms would take place everywhere. And the message isn't lost on Israel. Years of barren waiting, years of barren sorrow will suddenly give way to ever-flowing and blossoming grace in their lives. Or they sow in tears and the writer takes that agricultural image and he says, you know what sowing seed is like. You sow with the hope of a harvest, but you just don't know. But with God you do. A life sown in the Lord is sown in this world with all of its suffering, its pain, its emptiness, its disappointments, its fears, its challenges. 
And he will reap a harvest of joy. And we will carry the bounty of God. And so the psalmist looks to the past and he looks to the future. And he's not ignorant. He's fed up with life in the spirit of Psalm 120. And he sees the dangers of the hills in the spirit of Psalm 121. But he says, neither one of those take away our joy. Why? Because I belong. Body and soul and life and in death to my ever-present and faithful God. And so our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues with songs of joy. We may say, what does this have to do with Advent? And the answer is, everything Israel looked to in the past and everything they hoped for in the future was answered in Jesus Christ. You read the story of Luke and you read the story of Matthew and it's a story of joy. John is going to be the forerunner to point to Jesus. And when it's announced to Zechariah and Elizabeth that they will have a baby in their old age, it simply brings joy and delight. And they say many will rejoice because of John. And when Elizabeth becomes pregnant and she goes to visit Mary, the mother of Jesus, when John in Elizabeth's womb hears the voice of Mary, it says he leaped for joy because of the gospel that's about to be revealed. Mary has a visit from an angel. She will carry the Messiah in her womb and give birth to God. And she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit will rejoice in God my Savior. And when John the Baptist is born, it says that everyone was filled with joy. And when Jesus was born, the angel announces to all creation, there is good news of great joy. These were an ignorant people. These were people who were fed up with life. These were people who journeyed through the hills and knew the dangers that everyday life presented. But they didn't measure joy by circumstance, but they measured joy by a person, a relationship. And they knew in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, they could say, I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And so their mouths were filled with laughter and their tongues with songs of joy. Let me ask this question. Is that you and me? Do we look to the first advent and our mouths filled with laughter? And do we look forward to the second advent and have tongues that will sing songs of joy? I look at the first coming of Christ and He bursts on the scene and everything changes. A woman caught in adultery. She broke the law. People pick up their rocks. They're ready to stone her to death. Jesus bends down and engages in a little artwork in the sand. The people walk away and he gets up and he says, has no one condemned you? No. Neither do I. And she's filled with joy. And there's a woman at a well who's searching for love in all the wrong places and suddenly meets this Jesus who fills her with the value and the dignity she wants so much as a human being made in the image of God. And because she's filled with the joy of the gospel, she becomes the greatest missionary in that region of the world. And there's a two-bit tax collector. His name is Zacchaeus. And he's a Jew, and he works for the Roman Empire, and he collects his taxes, and he overcharges, and he pads his own pocket at the expense of his own people. And he was hated, absolutely despised. And Jesus goes to his house, and he's filled with joy, and he joins the gospel mission of Jesus. I think of my life and your life. 
that you and I have as much sin, as much guilt, as much shame in our lives. And yet Jesus comes beside us and says, I'm not ashamed to call you my sisters and my brothers. And he fills us with joy. And can you imagine looking to the future? Hearing that vision, that voice, and now the dwelling of God is with children, women, and men, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, no more cardiac arrest, no more sudden infancy death syndrome, no more HIV AIDS, no more mental illness, no more depression, no more loneliness, no more war or racial hostility or domestic violence. Can you imagine that day when God will make all things new? You and I should be fed up with life, but it doesn't take away our joy. You and I will travel through the hills, but it doesn't take away our joy. Because we too can say, I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And so my mouth is filled with laughter and my tongue with songs of joy. But maybe a little warning. Watch out for the dictatorship of the soul. We sometimes think that we have to get rid of things to have joy. That we have to get rid of the pain in our lives through alcohol or sex or drugs or we have to get rid of our disappointments by depersonalizing our relationships or we have to get rid of our boredom by taking a vacation we can't afford only to discover the pain comes back only to discover the disappointment doesn't go away and only to discover that when we get back we're still bored This psalmist is not ignorant, neither are you. Joy is not the absence of pain and suffering and hurt. The joy is discovered in the midst of it. Joy is discovered in a world where we are fed up. Joy is discovered in the hills. Because it's those things that fix our eyes properly on what true joy is, a person who says, I have you in my hand. Paul says in Romans 5 that we rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces hope, and all of that is called joy. And in Romans chapter 8, he takes all of our present sufferings and he says it's like a birthing room. It points to the new birth of all creation and the eternal joy that God will bring in Jesus Christ. Joy is not feeling good about our circumstances. Joy is not feeling good about ourselves. Joy is feeling good about God and His advent, who He is and what He has accomplished in His Son. I don't know about you, but I'm fed up with life. But I'm not scared to journey through the hills. Because with you I can say too, I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior because I belong body and soul in life and in death to Him. We need this message going forward. Because all this world has to offer us is pain and sorrow. I read an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal this week. The Wall Street Journal just, it was written by a Catholic priest, very perceptive. And he simply acknowledged that all the efforts to mitigate COVID and all the efforts to protect human lives has really been good. But he says, for goodness sakes, 
when governors say that churches can't meet and churches can't sing and they're not allowed to get together over the Christmas holidays, he says all we're dealing with are the gods of Babylon, the Nebuchadnezzars that tried to shut down Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And it's at that point that we say, I will not bow down to those gods. But instead I will stand up and my mouth will be filled with laughter and my tongue will be filled with songs of joy because the God I serve is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and He has sent His Son and He is the flesh and blood presence that says we are safe as we journey through the hills and as we live with the fed upness of life. But that is where I am. That is my joy, and that is my song. And so we come to this psalm, and it invites us to say, I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul. It allows me to say, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. I hope this morning, and in all the pain and the brokenness of life, and all the strangeness of this year, we can say our mouths are filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And who can say this? And who can sing this? Anyone. Anyone. Because Jesus has come and said, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you the joy of my rest, the joy of my love. Because the worst of the world may abandon you, not me. You belong to me. Our mouths should be filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. And all God's people said, Father God, we thank you, we praise you, we worship, we adore you. We thank you for a psalm that invites us to the pinnacle of our faith, that because we have received Your love in Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit, we are filled with joy, not because everything is right, but because You love us, and You have given us Your Son, and You have claimed us as Your own. Thank You, Lord, for Your rich love and mercy. Massage our hearts with Your grace, Teach us to sing that song of joy that you are great and greatly to be praised. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' great name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand to receive God's parting blessing, and then we're going to sing together joy to the world. Raise your hands with me if you wish. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. And may he fill your mouths with laughter and your tongues with songs of joy as you glorify him each day. Let all God's people say, Amen.